For 10 years, I had the privilege of teaching the church administration class at Lancaster Theological Seminary. The class was one of those nuts and bolts classes. How do you read a spreadsheet so you can understand congregational finances? Why it's important to keep good records and have job descriptions and personnel policies and child protection policies? How to have good communication strategies, stewardship, and how to deal with conflict? I even invited an attorney to come to the class as a guest speaker because there are so many ways in which churches can get themselves into legal trouble. And he used to deem his class, it takes a law firm to support a local church. A favorite part of the class for me and for the students was sharing case studies, those real life occurrences that happened in my ministry or in someone else's ministry. And to this day, I still remember one student looking at me rather aghast after one of those case studies saying, please tell me that this really doesn't happen. I could not prepare the students for everything. My hope was to have them identify their gifts and their skills for ministry, and that I could help provide some tools that would give them a foundation for what was to come. And I hoped that I would save them a little bit from some surprises. But by far, by far, the most pressing and difficult topic of the week was the question of authority. By what authority would they, as pastors, talk about these things or do some of these things as leaders? And you can understand that concern, even that fear. Many of us have had less than positive experiences with authority figures, people that we've trusted or revered or honored who have broken the law, broken rules, broken boundaries, people in authority that we've seen ridiculed and even threatened when they lead. And we brought all of that stuff to the classroom. And I had to keep reminding myself and the students that there was nothing I could teach or share that week that did not begin with my understanding or their understanding of the office of pastor, of what it meant to be a leader and what it meant to lead with the authority that comes with our ordination. We all understood that ordination is not a license to be a dictator or to exercise control over a church, but it is an authorization to lead. And it's a function that's been long established by the church. And it's an expectation that we will lead. So here's a story about one of my surprises about leadership and pastoral authority. Like many congregations, the congregation I served back then prepared various kinds of suppers to raise money. And lots of church folks will claim that these suppers are a great time of fellowship. I'm sorry, that was not my experience. And it certainly wasn't my experience the night that I came into the church kitchen and found over a dozen people tired, frustrated, yelling at each other and dropping the F-bomb. They seemed downright possessed (laughs) with something evil. There were about a hundred people sitting out in the fellowship hall eating their meals. And even over the general noise of that conversation and their eating, you could still hear the shouting in the kitchen. And I walked into that and I was wondering, what will these people think about us as a church? So after I got over my surprise of what I was hearing, and also wondering why someone in that room had not calmed that shouting and yelling, I pulled myself to my full five feet, claimed my pastoral authority, and I told them that it had to stop and that I would see all of them Wednesday night at 7 o'clock and we would talk this out. And if they didn't show up, I was going to go to the consistory and recommend that there would be no more suppers because of this behavior. And you know what usually happens when someone takes leadership? 
people start to argue with the leader. They started protesting. I didn't understand. We really do need this money for the the church pastor. Um, And I said the money was not worth it. There were all kinds of excuses that came my way. They didn't have enough help. Somebody that was in charge was diabetic and his blood sugar was low. And that's why he was dropping the F-bomb. And I just kept saying, stop, stop. I'll see you at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. It took a lot of energy, as you can imagine, to walk away (laughs) and not engage in the arguing. But what was wrong is wrong. And this episode was against our Christian values and our values as a congregation. You know, the pastor ought not to be the only one with authority calling out bad behavior. What was wrong that a dozen other people recognized bad behavior but did not take the necessary steps to de-escalate the situation and send people home who were out of control. I would ask students to imagine what they had seen and what happens in congregations when someone does not claim authority to deal with unhealthy and disruptive behavior. Do we not love God, our church, and one another to address these unclean spirits that too often permeate church life. See, when we as pastors are ordained, we make promises to administer the sacraments faithfully, to teach and preach the gospel, and to speak the truth in love. And we kneel. We kneel as an act of humility, and the clergy present come forward, and they lay hands on our head, and there's a prayer. There's a call to prayer and affirmation of ministry, and it's the community that affirms that call. It's not just about the pastor feeling a call. It's affirmed by the community, and we are given the authority to execute the office of pastor. Those hands remind us of the weight of the promises we have just taken, but also of the support and the authority that comes from the community. I would remind students that when those hands are laid on your head, there is an expectation that you will lead, no matter how difficult or how painful it might be. We also practice that laying on of hands with our lay leaders because we recognize that leadership is a challenge, but it's also a time when the community affirms someone's leadership. And so also we lay hands on those who have been called as deacons and elders and committee chairs, and we as a community proclaim that we have given them the authority for leadership, and we will honor their leadership. We find Jesus today, once again, claiming his call and his authority in his teaching, in his preaching, and in his healing. Jesus claimed the authority to bring healing to all of God's people wherever that healing needed to be, whether it was in the synagogue, in the house, uh, or in the marketplace. He claimed that ministry, and he claimed the authority to do it, and people were amazed. I've wondered if they were amazed because he actually claimed his leadership and was unapologetic about it. We find that Jesus acts on that ministry. He is teaching when this man with the unclean spirit starts shouting. And Jesus um, doesn't, you know, give in to that shouting. What Jesus does is he recognizes that that man is in pain and has suffering. And he goes and he heals them. Jesus doesn't pay any attention at all to what the scribes are saying. He doesn't fret about what people are going to do or say. He claims his authority as a pastor, as a rabbi, as a teacher, as a healer. When people say, what is this, a new teaching, we can go to Professor Amy Jill Levine, who speaks of the ways in which the Jewish Jesus isn't necessarily teaching something new, but rather he's extending, extending or broadening the understandings in Judaism. 
He wasn't necessarily creating something new, but bringing new insights into the foundations of what people already knew. They knew they were supposed to love God and love their neighbor. They knew they were supposed to share with the poor. They knew they were supposed to welcome the stranger. They knew that God loved everybody. But Jesus would tell stories about lost sheep and lost coins and riches and what the kingdom of God was like. And he extended people's knowledge so that they could grasp in a new way or have new insights into what God was was doing in their lives. Why were people amazed? Maybe they were amazed because they heard it differently, had one of those aha moments. Maybe they were amazed because they had spent years and years running after a different kind of message and suddenly they got it. Perhaps they were amazed that Jesus was a leader, that he was willing to claim his place in that time and even stand up to the powers of Rome when others would skirt away. People, I think, may have just been amazed because he claims his leadership with humility and authority. Jesus puts his words into action as he heals that man in the synagogue that day. What do we do? So I'll raise this same question I raised last Sunday. How is this text speaking to you? If you, with your authority that you've been given at your baptism as a beloved child of God, if you, with your authority as a disciple of Christ and with humility, seek to love your neighbor and model a life of love and concern for others, there may be people around you who are amazed. It is not a new teaching, but it might seem new in the world in which we're living. It might seem even radical, as some people have experienced Jesus' radical message of love. And people around you may say, who are you to speak such love and care? even with authority. It's not just the pastor. It's not just the pastor. It's all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus. All of us who are members of this household of faith are called to claim the authority to live and speak in love. Are you doing what God has called you to do? Some of us are called to be pastors, and some of us are called to be singers, and some of us are called to be teachers and healers, and some of us are given gifts of knowledge and wisdom and the powers to distinguish between different voices, but everyone is given gifts for ministry. Those gifts are given by the Spirit of God, and those gifts are meant to be shared. Nothing in seminary had prepared me for that evening long ago at a church supper that was going downhill fast. I didn't have a referee shirt. I wish I would have had a whistle. But what I did have was my authority as their pastor. I had their respect because I loved them. I had been promised by them that my leadership would be honored. And I had my call from God to model the gospel of love into action. I wasn't sure I would still have a job after Saturday night. So when Wednesday night came around and people showed up at the church, I first of all gave God thanks that everyone showed up. It demonstrated their respect for the office of pastor. It demonstrated their love for one another and their love for the church. We talked about the frustrations of that dinner, the dynamics, and we worked together on a plan for suppers to continue. Everybody was calmed down. Everybody remained friends. Nobody left the church. Everyone promised that they would watch out for one another.